Over the past 90 years, the concept of GDP has become one of the most ubiquitous three-letter acronyms around the world. After Bretton Woods in 1944, it became a worldwide metric, outlasting even the gold standard. Consumers of economic news are quite literally inundated with statistics on GDP growth almost daily. Startup pitches and public company earnings presentations alike, especially from emerging markets, love to cite the GDP growth of their respective region as a selling point for prospective investors. The World Bank and the IMF, along with countless investment banks, have teams of analysts calculating historical GDP and forecasting future growth. The legendary professor, Angus Madison, who passed away in 2010 and left behind an impressive legacy of work, even calculated GDP per capita for several countries going back 2,000 years. But it is worth stepping back to ask a fundamental question. Does rising GDP lead to shareholder value creation? In which cases and under what circumstances? To try to answer this, institutional investors have segmented the world into ostensibly lower GDP growth developed markets and higher growth emerging markets, just as they divide the world into growth stocks and value stocks. But looking at high level aggregates is often too simplistic and doesn't explain the full picture. Despite all the effort that goes into separating growth versus value stocks within the MSCI World Index of Developed Economies, their performance over long periods of time has been almost the same. And while there has been a modest difference of about 130 basis points of annual compounding between MSCI's DM versus EM indices, with EM slightly ahead, looking at aggregates at 80,000 also doesn't explain the full picture. To delve into this, I spoke with Friska Claudia, who works in Asia Partners' Jakarta office. Friska is also an investor operator, having worked at Japfa, a pan-Asian agricultural and food company, managing strategic projects across the company's downstream business units. She is also an alumna of McKinsey & Company's Jakarta office. She grew up on the island of Java in Indonesia and is a graduate of the University of Hong Kong. Friska, pleasure to see you. Tell me more about why you think the popular framework of lumping countries into DMs and EMs is too simplistic. It's not that we feel the DM and EM classification is wrong per se, but rather that there seem to be a hidden set of variables that might arguably be more important in explaining why some countries' stock market do better or for others over a long period of time. Let me lay out a few examples of what we mean. On this exhibit, you can see that on the left-hand side, a ranked list of countries by their country equity IRR over a pretty long period of time, year 2000 to 2022. This is in US dollars. And likewise, on the right-hand side, you can see a ranked list of countries by their nominal GDP growth rate over the same period of time, also in US dollars. If higher GDP growth mechanically translated into higher equity IRR, you would expect to see that the name of the countries is in a roughly similar order, but instead you see something quite different. To pick on a country close to home to us, Vietnam has had a second fastest nominal GDP growth, but is in the bottom half of value creators. China has had the very fastest nominal growth as well, but is in the middle third of value creators. And Saudi Arabia has had 8% nominal GDP growth, but essentially has been flat for equity holders for over more than two decades. That's a puzzle worth solving. Does it also go the other way around? Low growth countries that create shareholder value? Absolutely. It's not categorical, but there are several examples of that. Consider Japan, whose nominal GDP in dollars has actually shrunk in the past 22 years, and yet its equities have yielded 4.3% annually. Or Mexico, whose equity return is roughly double, its nominal GDP growth. Whatever solution there is to this puzzle has to account for that too. We came at this puzzle hoping to go one level deeper than simply saying that there's a weak correlation and leaving it at that. We were interested in trying to see if there were patterns where certain countries more likely than not to have a higher linkage on a sustained basis and other countries a lower linkage. And did that change over time? Taking a step back, you could imagine a few different patterns that might emerge. To illustrate that, let's pick a year where that was neither the top of the cycle or the bottom, but more in the middle and far enough back in time that we can see what happened since then. We picked 2004 since the data were available for a lot of these countries for 2000 and onward. 
Let's say, to be able to look at these countries on an apples to apples basis, that we normalize each country nominal GDP to 100 in 2004, and likewise normalize their stock market index in dollar terms to 100 in year 2004 as well. Then we can see what happens as we advance the clock year by year and draw a curve that links each of the annual data points. And in situation where the data was available, we could also reverse the clock and see what happened before 2004. Just thinking from the first principles, you could imagine how the curves might progress from the year 2004 through 2022. Different trajectories, if you will. Let's start a bit out of order with Model 3, which we call fair and balance. That means for each 1% of nominal GDP, the country's stock market index also grows 1% in dollars. That then said into a pretty much 45 degree line pointing northeast, which is a dotted gray line. Model 3 is a thick blue arrow that follows that 45 degree line. Now let's think about variations on that theme. If, for whatever reason, the stock market grows over faster than nominal GDP over a sustained period, it might be too good to be true. That's what happened to Japan leading up to the famous crash in 1989, for example. We call those too good to be true situation model 2. And you can see the purple line tilted at by more than 45 degrees, and we call it north by northeast. On the other side, you could imagine nominal GDP is growing, but you're not seeing that reflected in the stock market. Something is out of sync. That's the green arrow, which is less than 45 degrees. Let's call that model 4. Could there ever be a good reason, a valid reason, why a country could be a too good to be true? We saw that some countries persistently seem, over a very long period of time, to have a slope of more than 45 degrees without major corrections. Those countries were generally ones with very successful multinationals companies who were able to draw upon global GDP as their end market, not just the domestic GDP. We called those global champions, and we designated those model ones. To be fair, there's a fine line between Model 1 and Model 2 that is ripe for a crash, and plenty of Model 1s have their own corrections along the way. What is Model 5? As we went through the process of trying to classify countries based on the trajectories of this chart, we kept finding countries that didn't just have a low conversion of GDP growth into equity value, but actually had a pattern of quite a literally circular motion. Their GDPs and stock indices would each decline, and then rise again, and then potentially decline. That's what's different from Model 4, where GDP seemed to march by and large rightward, soon with non-proportional conversion into upward movement. We call those circular mo situations Model 5. Is it safe to say that some models are better than others? Yeah, absolutely. All else equal, you would want to be a Model 1 but only a small numbers of countries have multinational global enough and competitive enough to do that. Next in order is being a Model 3, which is a very respectable place to be. Where you should get worried is if you fall into a Model 2 territory. We'll come back to that in the moment, but there's a reason why we have the dotted line going down. It's not much better being a Model 4. In fact, mod many Model 2s ends up being Model 4s, or even worse, Model 5s. The 1990s were very much Japan's lost decade after the crash in 1989. So when you apply this approach, how do the countries fall into the different buckets? It looks like this. Note that there's a fair amount of subjectivity, which is why we are publishing each of the trajectory in the fourth edition of our annual report. We would love to get the community's feedback on whether they classify the country somewhere else. Unpackage this for me if you could. I see you still kept the EMDM dichotomy. Yes, but it's more as a way to highlight that the five models actually transcend the EM and DM buckets. That's what we hope to find, as we were a bit unsatisfied with the EMDM framework as an explanatory variable. In fact, other than Model 1, the global champions, there are EMs and DMs in each of the other four models, which is a way of saying, at least to us, that what matters more is which model you are, not whether you are an EM or a DM. The second thing that comes across is that there are, even despite 
the market correction, several markets that strike is as too good to be true. I'm sure others will disagree, but we invite folks to see charts for themselves and form a few. I'll come back to Model 3 in a moment. And there are a lot of Model 4s, more than we would have expected. And some surprising countries fall into this bucket, many more than we would have expected given the constant barrage of headlines about the GDP growth in many of them. And perhaps most depressingly of all, we were really surprised truly by how many countries fall into Model 5, especially in the years after 2007. It feels more like a lost 15 years than a lost decade. And while a lot of these countries are in Europe, it's not just a European dynamic. There are examples on almost every continent, both EMs and DMs. Which brings us back to Model 3. We have a special fondness and respect for these countries. They strike us as giving a fair deal to shareholders. What's striking is how few of them there are, just eight by our count. And what makes us thrilled to be in, in Southeast Asia is that our region is home to a quarter of them, with several other in close proximity like Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Korea. This is a huge positive for companies in our portfolio like ShopTech, which is in five out of those eight Model 3 countries, plus several others. But surely this isn't static. Can you change models? Absolutely. There are some countries like India, which, despite of all the headlines you read, has actually been a remarkably consistent Model 3 for quite some time. But other countries change models from time to time, not every year, but over decades. Japan is a great example of going from Model 2 to Model 4 and then back to Model 2. It really runs hot and cold. Malaysia, here in Southeast Asia, is a great example of a Model 2. Remember when they built the tallest building in the world in the mid-1990s? Which became a Model 3, which was a good news, but then slipped into a Model 4. We hope that Malaysia will one day become a Model 3, but last 12 years has been pretty consistently Model 4. Four hour flight away from Singapore, Bangladesh went from Model 2 straight to Model 4, with not Model 3 transition in the middle. And a bit further afield, Egypt, which is one of the world's 15 largest country by population and doesn't quite get enough attention from investors, likewise went from a Model 2 to a Model 4. There was a tantalizing period between 2008 and 2010 when it looked like a Model 3, but three years is probably too short of a period to make a classification. I'm seeing a pattern here, which is that Model 2s generally don't turn out well. That seems to be the case. Perhaps that's really the key litmus test between a Model 1 and a Model 2. So of course it's easier to see that in hindsight. But we can take that gut sense and make it a testable proposition. If you're starting to fear up above that 45 degree line, regardless of what model we think you are in, what's the risk that next year you will have a correction? In the game of golf, there's a fairway, and on the other side, there's a rough, an area of thicker and higher grass. Imagine the blue line above, which is the Model 3 textbook example, is surrounded by an increasingly challenging rough, which are the gray lines on the other side. We've chosen the ratios to be equidistant on a lock-lock axis. So now the question is, as a function of how far away you get from the fairway into the rough, north of the blue line, how much risk is there for a correction? Turns out, quite a bit. There's always a chance for a correction, even when you're on the 45 degree line. Markets are volatile after all. But the higher you get above the line, and the further into the rough, which corresponds to moving down this page from the middle to the bottom of the page, the higher the risk that in the next calendar year, your stock market index calls. In fact, Whenever you are at or above the 1.5 line, which means that the stock market level is 1.5 times the nominal GDP level, relative to both being 100 in 2004, and the stock market went up that year, you've got a greater than 40% chance that the next year is going to be a down year. It's important to note that it's not a sure thing that it will fall next year. Why not? Well, some of the countries are the very rare model ones, whose total addressable market isn't just the whole market, it's the whole world. 
But more importantly, Model 2s can build up a head of steam, so to speak, for many years in a row. Remember Japan in the 1980s? The crash could have happened any time in the late 80s. It just ha happened to happen in 1989. Loosely speaking, once you're at 1.5 and above, and you're not a Model 1, you're definitely in the danger zone. India is a great example of seeing this in action. Each time the blue line got a bit too high, it got corrected downward. And each time it was too low, it got corrected upward. Somebody must be good at golf over there. Can we take a look at some of the other countries? What do the elusive Model 1s look like? Let's start with those. There's a very small number of them around the world. Denmark's a good example with a 76 degree slope since 2004, rather than the 45 degrees. For 30 years, being that far off the diagonal hasn't hurt it. Part of this may be the influence of Novo Nordisk, which is at a $310 billion market cap, is far and away the biggest public company in the country, by a factor of 7x, and a very global company. Germany is a model one as well. Ditto for Switzerland. It's a judgment call as to whether a 53 degree slope since 2004 is a Model 1 or Model 3, but we erred on the side of being generous and called it Model 1. Three big companies, all very global, dominate the Swiss index. Nestle, Roche, and Novartis. That's probably a part of what you're seeing here. And the United States strikes us as the Model 1 fair as well. 58 degrees feels far enough from 45 degrees to make that call. And to say that the US has successful multinationals is an understatement. It goes back to our bonsai tree framework, where most of the category 1 bonsais are from the USA. Remember, the Google of Thailand is Google. The Netherlands is an interesting one. For most of the time period, aside from a brief Model 2 episode in the late 1990s that sorted itself out, it's been a Model 3. But if you look at the last 7 or 8 years, there's a case to be made that with a 66 degree slope since 2004, it's a Model 1. The company that's driving that is ASML, which is by far the most valuable company in the Netherlands, at the 264 billion market caps as of this filming. Process, which has a 165 billion market cap and includes com internet companies around the world, is second, though it went public more recently. Heineken, at the 57 billion market cap, is third, and that's also a very global business. The global payments company Aiden is number six by market cap in the Netherlands at 46 billion, and it's still well above 2008 IPO price. Who's a Model 2 then? There are two clear candidates for now, Argentina and Japan. They couldn't be more different, but they are both Model 2s. Here's Japan. Again, you can see it was a Model 2 until the 1989 crash, then a Model 4, and now it's Model 2 again, and has been for quite some time. The slope here is literally 90 degrees. It's gone vertical since 2004, despite virtually no change in nominal GDP. That should worry everyone. And yes, while it has multinationals like Toyota, Sony, and SoftBank, it also has a lot of companies that link to and frankly constrained by domestic GDP. Argentina strikes us as a pretty clear Model 2 candidate as well. It was actually a Model 5 during the late 1990s and early 2000s, and then had a spectacular recovery, almost Model 3-like. And But this last few years has put it far above the diagonal. Let's shift to Model 3. There are just eight. And to recap, a quarter of them are here in Southeast Asia, with another four nearby. We find that fascinating, how so many of the Model 3s are in the belt from India to Southeast Asia to Korea. The Philippines is a great example of a Model 2, turning constructively into a Model 3. It doesn't get anywhere near as much credit or attention as it deserves, as is Thailand. It's another great example of a Model 2, turning constructively into a Model 3. It's also one of the most active capital markets for IPO in our region, but most of it are domestically focused. As a Model 3, that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. Looking at our West, India is a Model 3 as well. One day, we hope to expand our investing program to India, especially as it starts to approach the golden age. 
we love markets like this, where GDP turns into shareholder value. Then looking northbound, South Korea has been a solid Model 3. Yes, there has been some going in circles, but the slope has been a textbook 45 degrees in angle since 2004. Here's Hong Kong, and here's Taiwan. That recent lift off from 2019 to 2021 from the 45 degree line is probably TSMC, which is by far the largest public company in Taiwan. And finally, New Zealand and Canada have been Model 3s as well. Yes, Canada had its own going in circles moment, but from 2004, the slope has been pretty close to 45 degrees. And Model 4? It's a long list. Let's pull out a few representative examples, some close to home and some further afield. The country that's probably the biggest surprise when we show this chart to folks is China. The stock market has been essentially flat from 1993 to 2022. Yet at the same time, the country's nominal GDP in dollars has grown by more than 30x. That is the raw data. It's worth pointing out that our understanding is that companies are based in China, but trade abroad, like Alibaba, are also included in the index. It's not just the onshore traded companies. Vietnam is another clear model for. At least, its market has grown since 2004, but not as much as its GDP has grown. The slope is just 23 degrees, coincidentally the same as China since 2004. Singapore is, likewise, a model for. It's not that the market hasn't grown, it's that the slope has been 30 degrees rather than 45 degrees. As is Indonesia, at least in the recent year, it had a great run from 2001 to 2010 as Model 3, and then something changed. We could roughly say the same thing about Malaysia, a great 15-year run after the Asian financial crisis from 1998 to 2013, and then something changed. And finally, Model 5. It's a long list as well. I'll share a few representative examples. We have all of them in the report on our website. This is just an off-the-cuff view, but it strikes us that Saudi Arabia goes from a Model 4 to a Model 5 based on the oil price. Something similar seemed to happen to the UAE as well. The UK, sadly, has been a textbook Model 5 over the past 15 years. And you can see something similar for Australia. So there's a case that is more of a Model 4. Brazil gets attention from institutional investors from time to time. It's gone from a Model 2 to a Model 5 since 2007. Finland has an interesting history, going from a tech darling during Nokia years in the 1990s to a Model 5 more recently. This is really interesting. What for you are the implications for Southeast Asia? First and foremost, we are lucky to have two of the very rare Model 3 countries in our region and to have another four of them in close proximity as our portfolio companies expand. Again, Shopec is a great example with operations in five of the eight Model 3 countries. While it's true that the other four major economies in our region are currently Model 4s, at least none of them, for now, are Model 5s and some of them have been Model 3s in the past, which makes us curious about whether and how they might shift gears back to Model 3 in the future. And moreover, we do have an anecdotal sense that technology platforms, when run the right way, can transcend the underlying model of their country. C is a great example. While it operates in several Model 4 countries, as well as three of the Model 3 countries, that's the model we love, as a company, it's been one of the best performing public stocks over the past five years, taking the long view. And more broadly, that's in many ways been the lesson of China's tech sector. Against the backdrop of an underlying economy that's been modeled for since, arguably the 1990s, China's tech sector has created extraordinary amounts of aggregate values.